Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we are continuing on with Annihilation Scourge. And this is actually a fun little story. It's self-contained, right? I mean, it's just, it's totally self-contained. And these are some of the stories that I think can oftentimes be the most enjoyable. They're one-offs, right? You like, you get the story and then done. Like you, you set this down and that's it. For those of you guys who remember the, the first video that we did, and I'll link it down in the description so you can get caught up if you didn't if you didn't see it. But with the first video that we did, what we had talked about was that the Revengers, basically the uh, various Avengers out there from the Cancerverse, which is to say a universe where people can never die, where it was believed that universe was essentially destroyed, that turned out to not be the case. And instead, the Cancerverse had somehow found a, found a way to invade the Negative Zone, right? So as a result of that, you had Annihilus, who basically was the leader of the Negative Zone, kind of this self-appointed ruler of the entire area, just because his forces were large enough for him to just conquer it. He had ultimately ended up fleeing the Negative Zone and then trying to find aid. And so what this does is this basically picks up initially with Johnny Storm. Now, here's the cool thing, is this actually makes references to Jonathan Hickman's run on the Fantastic Four. And it's one of the coolest things, because for those of you guys who read that run or who saw my videos on it, uh, there was was one point where like Johnny Storm died and what was one of the coolest moments ever in the history of his character right like dude it was ridiculously amazing like the portal to the negative zone gets opened up and like Johnny Storm basically stays behind in order to like keep the forces of the annihilation wave from pouring out so like you know it's like this really tearful farewell between like Ben Graham and Franklin and Valeria and so on because like they because they're like Johnny's gonna die right I mean like, he's gonna die fighting like billions of billions of these guys and so like there's there's this super amazing moment where Johnny turns around and he's just like all right guys flame on and it's just like dude that's like Johnny Storm goes out with a bang, right? It was it was the craziest thing. Now, of course, he ended up returning later on, but like moments like that are why I keep going back to Jonathan Hickman's Fantastic Four and reading it consistently, right? Because I've read it maybe three times since we first covered it, like since we first covered it on the channel. I love it. It's just an amazing story. And so ultimately what Johnny's doing or what he's experiencing is basically the, the nightmares he endured there, right? In the sense that like he was killed and then he was brought back and then killed and brought back and it happened over and over again. Now, eventually he basically rose to like take over the Annihilation Wave, right? To conquer the whole thing but it's like these dreams that he has constantly where he's facing off against the nihilist being destroyed so on and so forth and it just repeats itself over and over and over again and so as a result of that of course he's still doing what he's always done which is like pranking you know ben graham he puts like he puts shaving cream on his face and then like basically like makes it look like santa claus which is kind of funny uh, but the fantastic four themselves have basically gotten like a beacon like an sos call from the negative zone so of course they always have a portal in the baxter building to access the negative zone but basically like all these various refugees come fleeing out of the area now at that point they basically basically tell us what's going to be a recurring theme. So we'll probably skip it for a lot of the other, uh, a lot of the other parts that we do here. But basically they're, they're just kind of talking about how like these forces that just can't die have basically managed to invade and everybody's just fleeing for their life is really all it is. Now, one of the interesting thing that goes on here is that they're basically told that like one of the forces here is the Sentry. And initially Reed Richards kind of takes it on and it's just like, okay, so there's some indication by Reed that like this is kind of his fault, right? That's kind of how he takes it on, that he believes it's kind of his fault initially. But Reed isn't really spilling the beans, right? Right? And so as soon as they get into the negative zone, their first foray is to come across Crystal of the Inhumans from the Revengers, whose face is all screwed up and, and twisted. Of course, again, that happens by the many angled ones. They physically mutate you as well as like turning you into an evil person. Uh, and then of course, you know, they, she ends up you know, almost killing them all and they manage to like subdue her and then ultimately end up, uh, end up basically taking off. But from there, what we end up doing is getting this explanation. And this is when, this is when things get cool, right? Because what Reed says is that after the events of Jeff Lemire's run, that the Sentry had come to visit him, right? Like Merge Sentry had come to visit him to say, hey, look, I'm trying to get myself sorted out. And so what Reed had done is that when, when Robert Reynolds requested that Reed find a way to remove the Void, any time that's ever happened where the Void and the Sentry have become separated, the Void becomes this wildly autonomous and insanely powerful entity that's nigh unstoppable. And so when Reed looked at him, he said, well, there's no real way to do it in our universe, right? There's no real way to separate you and the Void from each other, but maybe in the antimatter universe you can, in the negative zone you can't. And so ultimately, Sentry went in there by himself. Now, Reed offered to go with the Sentry shot him down. And so following that, something seemed to happen that basically led to the emergence of the Revengers inside the Cancerverse, which is actually kind of a cool and, and, and an interesting thing. From there, you basically end up running into the Cancerverse version of the Fantastic Four. Now, when the Cancerverse Fantastic Four show up here, they basically kind of start taunting the team. Now, you do kind of get this knockdown, drag out fight between the two where they all start going at it. One of the crazy things is that Reed has kind of wrapped himself, the Cancerverse version of Reed, has wrapped himself around the Cancerverse versions of Susan, Johnny Storm, and, and Ben Grimm. But they're all twisted, and they're screwed up, and they're evil, and, and, and like horrifying human beings. 
techniques. And so what you get is this almost kind of attempt by Johnny Storm, basically using the, the various technologies of Reed to kind of force them to see how their world is supposed to be, right? Like how the Fantastic Four in the main Marvel universe came up as opposed to the Cancerverse versions. And the Cancerverse versions are subjected to this universe where things could have been amazing, right? Where things could have been fantastic. The result of this is that what seems to have gone on here is that Reed and the Cancer universe had basically duped everybody else, right? Saying like, we have to join them. It's what's best for us, that kind of thing. There's nothing that we can do. There's no hope or anything like that. When it was, when, when reality, it was a lie, right? They could have lived incredibly good lives. And the result is that they all end up basically turning on the Cancerverse version of Reed. And of course, like Susan Storm in one of the coolest moments ever creates this like force field bubble around Cancer Reed, which basically like cuts off all of his arms and the little, you know, the, the various appendages that he has. And then in turn, Johnny Storm freaks out. Johnny Storm, of course, having sided with Reed and saying Reed made the right choice, uh, ends up incinerating Susan Storm. You know, things just kind of pop off really, really fast. Now, what you're seeing here in this instance with Cancer vs. Johnny Storm is he use, he's using his Nova Flame. Now, the Nova Flame is like the most powerful weapon that Johnny Storm has, right? Like literally he goes supernova, reaches about a million degrees Fahrenheit, more than enough to like destroy Ben Graham and, and all those various people. The idea is that when Johnny Storm uses it under normal circumstances, it saps all of his power except for whatever he needs to live. And that's basically it. And then of course it takes him a, a certain amount of time to recover. What he did here was basically sap all of his power. Now, by all standards of measurement, that's why, you know, the, the story is kind of weak to a degree is that it could basically save Susan Storm. Like Susan Storm used her ability to create force fields to protect the Fantastic Four. And we've seen that work before, right? I mean, she withstood the power of a celestial, uh, actually of multiple celestials. So it makes sense she can withstand, you know, a million degrees Fahrenheit, right? I mean, the, the, the shield of, of Susan Storm is ridiculously difficult to penetrate. The issue is all the other people who weren't protected and somehow managed to survive. <laughs> That's the issue. Or the fact that the planet itself managed to survive. It should have been like totally incinerated, right? Just like caught fire, spontaneous combustion, just because of the sheer temperature that Johnny Storm from the Cancerverse was letting off. But regardless of the circumstance, they all basically end up surviving. Those individuals who were around there and didn't burn up, you know, by virtue of, of the actions of Johnny, really kind of end up combining with the rest of the Fantastic Four and then continue on their mission to essentially face off and, and defeat the forces of the Cancerverse. Now, from here, we start getting into the good stuff. What this does is it switches over to Richard Ryder. Now, uh, when it came to Annihilus escaping his universe and the, the first place he arrived to was the Nova Corps, at least to, to Richard Ryder himself, right? Because the idea is that the Nova Corps was a, was a super elite fighting force before it was was totally obliterated. And so showing up here and looking for help, of course, as we saw in uh, Annihilation Scourge Alpha, Richard Ryder is like the only member of the Nova Corps left, right? I mean, there is Sam Alexander, but there really isn't anybody else left besides him. And so as a result of that, there's not a huge fighting force to help Annihilus. Now, of course, Annihilus's forces, have, or I guess his, his uh, the individual stowed aboard his ship have basically succumbed to the infection of the uh, of the Cancerverse. And so there's really no helping them. Uh, but Richard Ryder grabbing Annihilus and then basically grabbing the ship and pushing it into the sun and destroying those, those who were infected aboard the ship, what it does is it basically basically leads to Annihilus and uh, and Richard Ryder traveling to Earth to try to find the Fantastic Four. The funny thing about this is that Christos Gage plays it in a really interesting way when you essentially have, well, it's not really even Christos Gage, it's Matthew Rosenberg, uh, when you basically have them show up on the door of the Fantastic Four and they're met by the arrival of Franklin and Valeria. Now, here's the funny thing about this is that Franklin being here, you would expect him to be able to use his reality warping powers, right? Because at this point, he's adept enough in his abilities where he can do all kinds of different stuff. He doesn't. Instead, like him and Valeria pull guns on Nova and, and Annihilus. It's a smart move because Franklin's kind of the, the trump card for everything. But for those of you guys who are reading the solicitations that are coming up from Marvel, there's some huge stuff coming down the line with Franklin Richards, which is why I say the Fantastic Four, I think, are going to be the next big project before the X-Men in the Marvel Cinematic Universe because of the fact that Franklin's getting like so much screen time in your face in Marvel Comics, especially when they're doing huge events. They're going to be centered around his character and the, and, and the kind of power he has. One of the other funny things that goes on here is that Annihilus is basically knocked out by a blast from, uh, from Franklin and Valeria. And like, while he's unconscious, Franklin basically draws a snidely whiplash mustache on his face. <laughs> They give him eyebrows and a mustache. <laughs> but at the same time, they basically op open a portal to the negative zone and send them back through. Now, the initial thought of Annihilus is that Nova was going to just like drop him off there and leave him there to die. Uh, of course, that's not what's going to happen. That's, that's not what's taking place. But once they get back there, it's Nova really beginning to realize how bad things are. Because one thing to understand, and this is something that people tend to kind of lose track of when it comes to the original Thanos imperative event and the introduction of the Cancerverse, the Cancerverse didn't make it very far into the universe. They didn't conquer that much. 
much. In fact, they didn't even really conquer a world. A lot of people kind of tend to forget that and they kind of seem, you know, look at the events of, of the, the cancer versus almost like this annihilation conquest or annihil uh, annihilation wave event where like they get like way out there and like most of the universe is conquered and all that kind of stuff. It never really got on that scale. It never really got to that level. When you look at the scale for what it was, it was actually pretty small in comparison to a lot of other things that were going on. And that's exactly what's going on here, right? I mean, in this universe, they've managed to, to conquer a huge swath of the negative zone, right? Like a huge portion of the negative zone. So it's far more brave in terms of the amount of territory that's been conquered by the Revengers. Not only that, of course, Annihilus and Nova managed to find a couple people here and there on this particular world who have managed to survive, but like, that's basically it, right? I mean, there's not a whole lot going on there, but we do get this pretty significant revelation, right? When they're trapped on this world and ultimately the crying of a baby basically draws the forces of the Revengers, what Richard Ryder actually realizes is that the laws of physics and the laws of life and death in the negative zone don't work the same way as they do in the main Marvel universe. And so what this means is that when the individuals in the Cancerverse from, from, from that reality, when they're killed in the negative zone, they stay dead, right? They don't come back, which kind of seems to fly in the face of what we've seen before, uh, because what we've seen before is that they've been killed and they got back up again, right? So it kind of seems to be bouncing back and forth in terms of what's actually going on here. But the overall gist of this is that at the moment when these forces are destroyed by Nova, that, you know, with these, these energy beams, when they're incinerated, they're gone forever and they're not coming back, right? They're, they're, they're not able to make their return. And so after that, Nova goes on like this war path, right? Like all these, these various, like, you know, these Cancerverse forces that are trying to take him out like he annihilates them all no pun intended <laughs> He destroys them all. But as he makes his way through there, and as he destroys a whole run of these forces, suddenly he comes face to face with Robert Reynolds. And this is the first time in the history of Marvel Comics we've actually seen Richard Ryder fight the Sentry. And the fight goes exactly the way you would expect. Richard Ryder gets dominated. I mean, it's, it's not even fair. <laughs> It's not even funny. He gets crushed. Like he goes to punch the sentry and like the sentry is just kind of like, what in the heck? And then when like Richard Ryder tries to take off, the sentry grabs his foot and just like smashes him into the ground. And then like, that's basically it. Like Richard Ryder's defeated <laughs> that quickly. Of course, this allows the other Avengers to come in, you know, the Captain America Avenger and Thor and, and uh, Carol Danvers and so on. But of course that basically leads to him, uh, you know, kind of getting out while he can. Ultimately, it's really believed by the forces of Annihilus that like Richard Ryder had abandoned them, right? You know, he kind of, you know, uses this device to basically travel back into the main Marvel universe in the negative zone and they believe that he's he's basically taken off on that's kind of an important thing right that's that's the cool thing about stories like this is you get to see these encounters that you would never normally really see right that you would never no, uh, never see with these various characters meeting each other uh, you don't really get to see that uh, see that go down so of course this leads to basically silver surfer now after the events of silver surfer black and i don't think it's explicitly stated in the story as to why but after the events of silver surfer black where he was basically thrown all the way back to the very beginning of all re uh, of all creation right before the universe was made uh, in the realm that was occupied by nola symbiote god which i thought about covering but i was like eh, i got i got other stuff that i want to do but you know instead of that but when he was thrown all the way back there ultimately he ended up finally being brought back to the main marvel universe in the present time but he's essentially almost intangible right like things can't really touch him it's, it's, he's almost like a specter like a phantom things pass through him but watching all these things go down watching these forces of the negative zone basically come pouring out through these various portals like literally just fleeing from their universe then it's just kind of like what in the world is happening here right so he basically ends up passing through the rift and entering in the negative zone himself and just sees like essentially the cancer versus return now for silver surfer it's time to panic silver surfers faced off against this before right so he understands the severity of the threat that the cancer verse represents that if it's allowed to basically get out and if it's allowed to spread throughout the rest of the universe it'll destroy everything in its path right i mean it'll just kill and, and annihilate everything that it comes across and so silver surfer while nothing can really touch him he can touch things but only with energy blasts right not with physical punches or anything and so these various forces in the negative zone are dealt with pretty quickly and that's basically it you know they're kind of dealt with pretty quickly and harshly but what he picks up on is that there's something out there in the rubble that's basically hiding and when he travels through and he ends up locating it he ends up finding robert reynolds now again as you guys who are familiar with the century are aware of that you have three versions right you've got the century you've got robert reynolds and you've got the void right they're three distinct different personalities and what he does here is he basically kind of fills in the gaps from where the fantastic four uh, the fantastic four explanation left out what we're told here is that once robert reynolds left and went into the negative zone that what he ended up doing was basically absorbing all the negative zone antimatter energies that were there. Now, of course, antimatter versus positive matter basically can lead to a uh, kind of explosion on the atomic level. I mean, I'm not super well knowledgeable about physics, so I'm not 100% sure about like the properties of ma uh, matter versus antimatter and how it all ties together. I mean, you know, I'm as good at looking up a Wikipedia article as anybody else is, but I'm not going to like espouse it as gospel truth. Uh, but the idea here is, is essentially what this did is it either forced the void to split with Robert Reynolds or it allowed the void to leave. Regardless of the circumstances, the void and, and Robert Reynolds in the century were separate 
separated. And so with this version of Bob Reynolds that you have here, what you basically have is Robert Reynolds and the Sentry in a singular being. And then you've got the Void out there, who's the one that we saw fighting uh, Nova and so on and so forth. They took on the, the perception or the physical appearance of the Sentry. And it's just kind of been like that, you know, this entire time in the uh, negative zone. And so the result of this is that Silver Surfer basically looking at Robert Reynolds and saying, okay, all this seems to stem from you, then you and I are basically going to team up. And so what he ends up doing is basically grabbing Robert Reynolds, you know, kind of reaching into him and then absorbing Robert Reynolds and the Sentry into himself. And so in effect, the Sentry becomes a Silver Surfer. He even looks like it, right? I mean, he's got like the cape and he's got the belt with the S on it. And he's got the hair and everything, which is awesome, actually. <laughs> now from here, it picks up with Beta Ray Bill. And the Beta Ray Bill story is actually pretty legit, right? Like it's pretty amazing because what you get is basically Beta Ray Bill. It's kind of funny. Uh, Beta Ray Bill was on this world uh, with this, this guy, King Cyrax, I think is what his name was. And ultimately, like they believed that Beta Ray Bill was getting bored and they thought he was going to leave. And so what he did is basically engineer this whole ruse. And there's even like a guy dressed up as a monster, which is all kind of goofy looking. And uh, Beta Ray Bill's like, tis some form of trickery. <laughs> But basically, like, when there was an actual threat and the world was was basically saved, suddenly, like, this rift begins to open up, right? Almost, you know, very reminiscent to the one that we saw from the original uh, introduction of the Cancerverse in the Thanos Imperative story. And as soon as that happens, basically, you kind of switch back over to the negative zone and you have, like, all these forces, these negative zone forces, trying to basically stave off the many angled one forces, right? The Cancerverse forces. And then in turn, trying to make sure that nothing passes through the rift, as well as some trying to make their escape. Now, as that happens and as some of the forces make their way through, suddenly, like, the main Marvel Universe is met by the arrival of the Cancerverse Doctor Strange. Now, this is kind of the cool thing because when this goes down, it's basically Doctor Strange versus Beta Ray Bill, which again is a, one of these, these interesting little concepts, these interesting little battles that we haven't really seen before. The problem with this is, is one of the Cancerverse forces makes the mistake of when they go to attack Beta Ray Bill that Lockjaw jumps in the way, right? Like Lockjaw basically being the dog that uh, is part of the Inhumans and him and Beta Ray Bill have apparently been friends for a very long time and gone on a lot of adventures together. Essentially, they hurt a man's dog. And as anybody who owns a dog will tell you, when you hurt a man's dog, you gotta pay the price. And the price is your life, or is that guy's life anyway. So literally, like, Beta Ray Bill destroys that guy, and then in turn, goes on a warpath and, like, destroys that version of Doctor Strange. And it happens fast. I mean, it's not even, like, this long, drawn-out battle. It's a one-page thing, right? Like, Doctor Strange goes to blast Beta Ray Bill. Beta Ray Bill deflects the blast using his, uh, Stormbreaker hammer, and then runs up on Doctor Strange and just, like, smashes him, and then that's basically it, right? Like, Doctor Strange is taken out. And so, what he ends up doing is talking to the Cancer, or to the, to one of the forces of Annihilus, who basically explains what we've been talking about this whole time, right? That like the negative zone's being overrun and, and so on and so forth, you know? And so when the question's asked, like this rift was not there before, right? So basically meaning somebody managed to take this portal, the, the, this, this little bitty portal that was there before that was closing down after Annihilus had passed through it to ultimately find Nova. Somebody had managed to grab this portal and begin ripping it open. So they essentially ripped a hole in the fabric of space. Who was it that did this? And of course, that's when this, this guy basically says it was the Sentry. And so what you end up having is Beta Ray Bill who goes charging headlong against the Sentry. And just like Nova before him, Beta Ray Bill gets decimated, right? He gets destroyed. Bam, bam, bam. I mean, he's he's totally outmatched and totally outclassed. And it makes sense, right? Because with the Sentry, it's uh, really even just with a Void, because it's not really the Sentry. But with the Void, it's not just strength that you're facing off against. It's astronomical speed, right? I mean, it's it's like faster than light speed. It's just, it's, it's ridiculous fighting speed that, you, that he's facing off against here. And so this fight was essentially over before it even started, right? And that's what, the, that's what the Void says, right? Like, this is a fight you can't win. Don't even try. And ultimately, that's exactly how it goes down, right? Like, Beta Ray, uh, Beta Ray Bill takes Stormbreaker and basically throws it at, at the void or throws it at the sentry and sends him flying back through the portal right at the time when the when the, the dimensional rift is closing up. Basically meaning the, the hammer gets stuck in the negative zone where the sentry is sent back. And so as a result of that, Beta Ray Bill is basically transformed back into his Corbinite form and then ultimately just kind of like, okay, we got to find a way to get my hammer back. We have to find a way to get into the negative zone and then basically help to defeat those forces. And so that's exactly what happens. Beta Ray Bill alongside Lockjaw basically pass through this dimensional rift right at the moment that it closes and they're in the negative zone as well. So what it does is it creates the, you know, in the, the uh, Annihilation Scourge Omega line, it creates this kind of coming together of, of Silver Surfer Sentry along with Nova and uh, Beta Ray Bill and the Fantastic Four, which is cool to see this whole thing go down, right? Because when you pick up into this, it's basically the, the Negative Zone Incursion Day plus 74 days, right? So it's been 75 days since this whole thing first started. And so, so with that going down, like as they get in there, the Fantastic Four are kind of off doing their own thing or at least, you know, traveling over to kind of see if they can't find some way to find where the source of this threat is or, or whatever the case is. 
just kind of picking up from where their story left off. And there's like this huge smoldering, you know, pile out in the distance. And once they travel over to it, uh, they end up finding like Beta Ray Bill just searching for his hammer and then in turn, ultimately finding it. Now, of course, this at the same time this happens, then you get the arrival of the Silver Surfer Century, right? So the Silver Century, as I want to call them, which is an awesome name now that I think about it, you know, but nonetheless, like it's, it's these, these forces kind of coming together and then like destroying these cancerous forces pretty quickly, right? I mean, they get it dealt with pretty fast, but it's kind of a, a coming together and like, hey, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? You know, how do we get here and all that kind of stuff? Not only that, we actually end up finding out that the uh, the Fantastic Four have been using Prison 42 as their base of operations and Susan Storm has been keeping, uh, been keeping it invisible. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, Prison 42 was actually created by Reed Richards in the Negative Zone as a prison for people who refused to sign the Superhuman Registration Act during the events of Civil War, right? So this goes back really, really, really far. But essentially, Susan Storm had made like the entire planet invisible. Not only that, all those various forces who have been trying to find uh, trying to find refuge, right? Who have been refugees escaping the worlds and, and the, the face of like this incursion from the, the Cancerverse kind of conquering world after world after world have basically taken up residence here. And it's, and it's interesting because it's like they're trying to survive, right? They're trying to live. And this is really the only absolute safe refuge left in the entirety of the negative zone because it's it's what the, the Cancerverse members cannot see, right? They can't see it and they cannot detect it. Such is the power of Susan Storm's ability to make things invisible. And so once they kind of get this whole thing organized and structured, who's going to be doing what and then how everything's unfolding, suddenly Susan Storm passes out. And the reason why is because her ability to maintain this invisibility of the planet is suddenly shook when we end up finding out the void is literally punching on the invisibility of the planet as well as the shield that Susan Storm is using to keep it protected. And now again, that's the power of the void, right? I mean, the void is one of these things where you don't really see his full totality. The full power of the void was really put on display in the what if story for Siege, where basically the void killed all the superheroes on Earth and then went out into the universe and conquered and like destroyed the universe, right? Like that's when you really see like the full totality of the void's powers, but you don't see it all that often. And not only that, what you end up doing is, is in the middle of all this, when it's all going to pot and the fear is that the void is going to punch through, suddenly the negative zone portal activates and then in comes Richard Ryder with the entire Imperial Guard and like a whole host of superheroes. And see, that's, this is the reason why Richard Ryder is so cool. He knows all the right people to gather if things pop off. That's why it's awesome to have him on your side, right? Because Richard Ryder has fought alongside pretty much everybody. And so if there's anybody that you want to have there when it comes to forming like a universal team, you want Richard Ryder there. One, because he'll fight to the end. And two, he knows which allies to call in based on various threats. But using the forces are really bringing in all these other universal forces, as well as Nova himself alongside the Silver Sentry with the Fantastic Four and with Beta Ray Bill, they really start to like decimate all these cancerverse soldiers who were there. The issue is they haven't found the source. And until they do, the Cancerverse will continue flooding in in the same way that it always has. It'll continue passing in over and over and over and over again. And so what ends up going on here is that with the Sentry being there, basically you end up having uh, the Silver Surfer who just rams through the Sentry and basically the, the Robert Reynolds Sentry aspect of himself merges with the Void. So they go back to being the way they were before. And then of course, it's kind of a kind of a return, kind of a state of normalcy. Everything sort of balances out only in so far as like Robert Reynolds and the Void go, right? I mean, they're, they're basically back to being the merged version of the character that you saw at the end of Jeff Lemire's run. And so as a result of that, now the question becomes, how do we stop the, the forces of like the Cancerverse, right? Because all this has done is fixed the century, but it hasn't fixed the source of the problem. And so you kind of get this, this really cool revelation when Richard Ryder takes off, you know, to go find the, the source of this whole thing, along with uh, the Silver Surfer who follows him. And you kind of get this explanation that what had gone on here is that when Robert Reynolds and the Void had split, it had created a rift in the negative zone itself, such as the power of the Void, right? To disperse that much power in such a shorter, in, and, and kind of like uh, an explosion of sorts, literally ripped a hole in the negative zone, which opened access to the Cancerverse. Now, I remember one of the things that we've talked about before is how the multiverse works in regards to the negative zone, that where you do have all these different universes that are out there, for all the universes that are there, there's only one negative zone and all those universes can access the negative zone. And so what it basically means is that it's literally a hallway of doors. And in this instance, when Robert Reynolds split from the void, he opened the door to the Cancerverse and all those folks came flooding in, right? And so with that being the case, the, the Cancerverse itself is really kind of, kind of shown is sort of like this entity trying to push its way through. Now, this entity is one of the many angled ones. And if you remember the original story, there was no top angled one, right? There wasn't like a mini angled one that all the other mini angled ones were beholden to. It was just the mini angled ones were like these demonic entities and they were the ones who started the Cancerverse. With that being the case, Richard Ryder actually makes the sacrifice. You know, it's the second time he's done it, you know, but he basically makes the sacrifice and saying, okay. So he absorbs the entirety of the Cancerverse into himself, which basically leads to uh, to the century uh, destroying Richard Ryder and the Cancerverse seemingly 
Stanley along with it. And so with Richard Ryder being completely destroyed here, my initial thought was, did they really just kill Richard Ryder in like some kind of one-off mini series? Is that really how they're gonna kill Richard Ryder? <laughs> Because in like the Thanos imperative, he went out like a hero, man. Dude, he would do it was it was amazing. Like it was it was him and it was Peter Quill with a cosmic cube. And you didn't know what happened until Richard Ryder came back later on, right? It was just kind of like, and they're done now. And that was basically it. And it was just kind of like, wow, like that's nuts. Like it was it was a really amazing ending. But the guy went out like a hero. And I was like, this is it. He's gonna absorb like whatever this entity is that's trying to get into the negative zone and then close down the portal to the cancerverse, and then that's basically it. It was it was kind of disappointing. <laughs> but ultimately, what ends up happening is that with, with Richard Ryder body being destroyed, it creates almost this kind of black hole as a portal begins to, to shut down. Now, everybody manages to make it out, but then like literally you have this page that comes up and says, and just like that, it ended. And it was just kind of like, okay. So basically like the day is saved, you know, by the sacrifice of Richard Ryder, the century is still kind of out there doing his own thing. Uh, and they, they really just kind of make it, make a, a cheer to Nova. You know, everybody's sort of celebrating the actions of Nova and the sacrifice that he made, but it's a cool thing because then you, you kind of switch over to the negative zone where you have a uh, Nova who's basically brought back. Richard Ryder is resurrected by a nihilist using the same technology they use on Johnny Storm uh, in order to bring him back. And then he tells Richard Ryder and the Silver Surfer to get out of his universe. And then the story ends, right? So like definitely the weakest ending ever in the history of a, of a mini series. It, it was kind of disappointing, uh, but that's basically it, right? Annihilation Skirt. It's a, it's an open and shut story, right? It's, it's really, really self-contained. And that's basically it. I think the ending could have been infinitely better. And I felt like it was kind of rushed. If I'm being honest, I felt like, like the ending was kind of rushed. I don't feel like it was supposed to end this way. It's kind of disappointing that it did. But you know, again, that's just kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to stories like this. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.